welcome to the Runlet and Baldacci Report. In the 20 plus years that I've been at this station, I've had a bucket list of people that I've wanted to interview uh, on this station. Uh, the number one on that bucket list and number two uh, will be accomplished as of today. Number one was George Mitchell, a friend of mine, a Bowdoin College graduate, uh, and easily one of the greatest public servants in the history of Maine and also the history of the United States. The second person is a man that I also became friends with. And when I saw him play against the University of Maine in 1962, I said to myself, I think this guy is gonna be great. Little did I know that within a decade, he would walk across 600 miles in the Northern District to be elected Congress uh, to the Congress of the United States. And then, in that same year, very close, become on the cover of Time Magazine as one of the foremost people in the Watergate issue. Uh, I am so pleased to have him. And Rob, you know him even longer than I do. Please do the honor of introducing our guest. Thank you, Derry. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to, to introduce uh, a fellow Bangor native uh, who I've known a long, long time. And his mother and father were part of our family growing up. Secretary of Defense, former Secretary of Defense, uh, William S. Cohen, or Billy as we've known him. Bill for. as we know it. <laughs> <laughs> Bill from Bowdoin College. Yeah. Go ahead, Rob, your first question of our guest. Yeah, Billy, just uh, as a fellow uh, Bangor native, talk a little bit about your childhood growing up, uh, Bill, because I, I, I think it's important for people to get a sense of your, the, the, your roots, and I know how important they are to you uh, growing up serving on the council along with my father and, and so many others and making such an impact. And then from there, the rest is history. But Mary talk Bangor. a little bit about your, your uh, growing up in, in our, uh, our great city, uh, Bangor, Maine. Well, Bob, thank you uh, for your kind words and going back to my roots in Bangor. Uh, I was born on the uh, third story of a tenement uh, building on Hancock Street. And Hancock Street was a street filled with immigrants. And if you just look at the, the names uh, along that street, you would find, obviously, you'd find Cohen, you'd find Caruso, uh, you'd find Gottlieb, uh, you would find McSimic. Uh, there'd be um, uh, Greek, uh, Syrian, uh, Jewish, Polish, Greek, as I said, Greek, and um I'm trying to think Irish as well, but down the line, they were all uh, families who uh, came from other countries. Uh, and so I grew up on that street the first eight years of my life. And then um, after the war was over, my dad was able to um, expand his little operation. And we moved exactly one mile from 278 Hancock Street up to East Summer Street, exactly one mile to the, to the point. And I moved from kind of lower class economically to lower middle class in that one mile. Um, but always uh, it was uh, a sense that I was part of a community that to me seemed large. Um, but when you talk about uh, uh, large cities, uh, Bangor being the third largest city in Maine with yep. a population of about 36, 37,000, it uh, tells you uh, we were all pretty small in terms of uh, pretty close. Everybody knew just about everybody else. And uh, that was a great thing to, to grow up in a city like uh, Bangor, Maine, and, and to have the friendships that have lasted over the years. It's just been an amazing part of my, my life. Uh, a big part of it was my father. And my dad was a baker who worked 18 hours a day, six days a week, uh, slept about three and a half hours a night, and uh, loved uh, uh, his work. And Making bagels, spent, didn't he? Didn't he make bagels? Um, yeah, what do they call them? Bulky rolls. Um, <laughs> and bomber rolls. <laughs> uh, the the bagels are, are are a very different type of uh, roll. But he, he <laughs> only he made, oh. but he made bulky rolls and rye bread. And uh, and one of the joys uh, as a young boy is I used to help carry these bags in my arms to the Baldacci restaurant, which was then <laughs> called Baltimore Restaurant. Baltimore, was, yes, that's correct. Located under the uh, under the bridge. On the Brewer Bridge, Bangor Brewer Bridge, and it was the place uh, that all the, uh, the uh, good folks tended to gather. They had spaghetti and meatballs and Ruby Cohen's um, bulky rolls, and occasionally you see some beer drinking uh, take place there as well. But I um, I loved to go in there, and my dad uh, loved to 
engage in conversation, challenge uh, the Baldacci family. He loved picking in an intellectual fight with them, so to speak, uh, on good good humor. Uh, and it just uh, it was a great family. The Baldacci family uh, and the Carlin family. Uh, we were from the beginning, I think, from three or four years old, um, and growing up uh, in the city of Bangor, knowing the Baldacci family. Well, Billy, Bill, uh, I have to say to you that uh, if you are what you eat, uh, in high school I would have been either a Pat's Pizza or a Baldacci Spaghetti from the Baltimore. And I'm going to jump ahead now, Bill. Uh, we'll go back and forth. But I want to ask you about 1992. It's 1992, and Bill Clinton has just been elected president of the United States. Where were you and what were you thinking about when the call came in or whatever it was that said, guess what? I'm tapping you for Secretary of Defense. Do you remember that moment? Oh, I do. Um, well, it was 1996, actually. Uh, 96, was, excuse uh, me. Right. Yes, of course. Six. And I had uh, announced my retirement from the Senate. I had spent uh, 18 years in the Senate, uh, another uh, six in the House. So I, a quarter of a century, I felt, was long enough for me. And I wanted to start a different uh, aspect of my life. And um, so I had just uh, purchased and I uh, had an option, assigned an option to uh, rent a, a you know, an office in downtown Washington to start the Cohen Group. And that was in uh, October of 96. And I got a call from uh, after the election was over. I had a call from uh, the White House, so to speak. Uh, and they said, would you like to come down and have lunch with the president? And I <laughs> said, yeah, of course. I, I didn't know him, really. Uh, I didn't vote with him. And I uh, said, maybe I shook hands with him five or six times during the course of four years at various functions. But we were not friends. Uh, and so I was said, sure, I'd love to come to the White House and uh, have a chance to have lunch with uh, President Clinton. Anyway, we met and uh, it was a conversation uh, that was more philosophical in nature. We, we weren't talking about politics. He just wanted to get to know me a bit. And so it was nice. It lasted about an hour. I left. And then I ended up in a few days flying to Bangkok in Thailand. I was giving a speech to the U.S. Thai Business Council. Turns out that President Clinton was over there to attend the birthday of the king. He was up on a podium. I was in the audience attending the king's uh, birthday. And I had a tie on, a yellow tie, and it had white elephants on it. Uh, it was a, quote, Jim Thompson tie, big silk um, uh, manufacturer in that part of the world. And President Clinton came off the podium and he spotted me. He said, by the way, are those uh, Republican elephants or are they Thai elephants? Very quick on my feet, Mr. President, they're Thai elephants. Today, today. <laughs> <laughs> he went back to Washington. I went on to Malaysia and then came back a couple of days later. And I had another call. Would I would like to come down and see the president uh, again? So I did. And this time was much more specific. And we had a... a the conversation went something like this, asking me about NATO, what I thought about the world, what did I think about how the Defense Department played in that world, et cetera. And then he said, uh, if I were to ask you to be my Secretary of Defense, what would you say? <laughs> I said, Mr. President, if you were to ask me and I were to accept, I would have to have these two understandings, understandings with you. Number one, if I accept it, uh, you would never have to worry about me going behind your back or that of the cabinet or the administration to tell my friends on the Hill, saying, you know what these guys are really thinking of down here? Uh, <laughs> because, I was, you know, I, I was part of the opposition party. Right. And it had never been done before to have a political figure, uh, an elected official from a different party uh, in, in, in a different administration, especially uh, for a position like Secretary of Defense. So I said, I will all I will be I will be absolutely dedicate myself to helping you achieve your goals, uh, provided it's consistent with my own uh, values. If I think something is antithetical to my true beliefs, uh, I will resign. And he said, OK. And I said, now, that's my promise uh, to you that I'll be uh, dedicated to your program. And I said, but you've got to give me a promise and you have to promise me that you'll never involve me in any political discussion in the White House or elsewhere. Let me go to the Defense Department, do what I uh, think I can do to help uh, uh, you in that capacity, uh, but uh, never ask me to come over, never ask me to participate in a political discussion. And he said, you got it. So uh, some time went by and I, I was told one day, um, I expect a call 
tomorrow at eight o'clock. And so I, I said, okay. And um, eight o'clock came the next day, no phone call. Uh, I was uh, living on Pennsylvania Avenue with, with Janet, uh, my wife. Yeah. And uh, I said, I've got to take our dog Lucky out uh, for a walk. She said, well, the wife is going to call you. I said, well, if they really want me, they'll call back. That was pretty arrogant of me to say that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, I took our dog out. We spent about a half hour walking. Sure enough, I came back into the apartment. And uh, Janet said, the White House called. I said, okay, I'll call back. So I called back. And I said, a very short conversation. He said, I want you to be sec deaf. I said, I agree uh, based on the two um, uh, promises we made. And then we hung up. That was it. And uh, Janet turned to me and said, what promises did you make? So then I advised her uh, the conditions under which I wanted to serve or would serve. And I think, and and after you took that position, uh, Bill, which was a huge honor, I know that Janet was very much a part of uh, real. You you and your wife were really a, a strong partnership, uh, representing the uh, United States and the uh, Defense Department all around the world. And I know she was she was I, right there with you. I just want to say, uh, Bill, uh, that I was a government major at Bowdoin College, and I want to say to the audience, folks, you have to understand that in American history a sitting president picking somebody from the other party right. to be a cabinet member in which many people consider to be the most important cabinet post in this day and age, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State being right up there. It is very uncommon for a president to pick someone in the opposite party and for a promise like Bill just talked about to have been made by two people. Rob, your next question. Yeah, I just, I'd like to go back a little bit, uh, Bill, and. Uh, I just want to mention your dad and your, and your mom, obviously, but your dad was such a, a factor, of uh, influence in, I know, your life, uh, but he was, he was such a great friend, your family with our family. And I remember when you were in the Senate, uh, and my brother John tells a story, apparently uh, from, from your dad, that uh, you, weren't, you weren't around, you were in, in Bangor at the time, uh, you were, uh, I don't know if you were Secretary of Defense or you were on the Senate Intelligence Committee, but the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee calls the, the Bangor Rye and talks to your dad and so he, he introduced himself as the chairman of the Senate <laughs> Intelligence Committee. I'm looking for uh, Senator Cohen. Is he around? And your dad, and God bless him, said, uh, well, if you're the, if you're the uh, chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, you ought to know where uh, my son is. <laughs> so, but that, that's just, his humor you was just, his humor was priceless. We loved him, uh, Bill, we loved him. I remember he would go into Mama Baldacci's because you went from uh, the Baltimore to Mama That's Mama correct. Baldacci. Uh, and uh, he would go in when I went out on weekends with him and they have a table ready and uh, one, uh, the colloquy would start. He would uh, say words, the effect, you talk about alimony? No, it's all the money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He would go to uh, engage in the repartee with everybody at the, at the uh, restaurant. So I know. We, it was wonderful. Uh, Bill, uh, Senate, uh, wa the uh, House Watergate Committee, when you were serving uh, with the leader of your party uh, facing potential impeachment, uh, what must have, what was that like for you as a member of the president's party sitting there uh, and, and voting ultimately for an impeachment, which, which didn't take Fresh place? Freshman congressman. Freshman congressman <laughs> from Bangor, <laughs> Maine, uh, staring down the the, the leader of your party, the yeah. president of the United States. And I, I, I asked that question in relation to what's going on now. But anyway, I'd like your, your, you know, what was going through your head at that point in time, Bill? Well, um, you know, I was a lawyer by training and I had a reverence for the rule of law. And if there's one thing I thought our party, obviously both parties too, but the Republican Party always said, we uh, believe in the law and order, the rule of law. Uh, and so I felt uh, that's exactly what my job was, is to uh, listen uh, to what had taken place, listen to the evidence, listen to the tape recordings, what I did for hours, and then uh, come to a conclusion where there are impeachable offenses committed. The pressure was on all of us to say, this is just a democratic plot 
to overthrow the election that was taking place. Nixon had won, I think, I think McGovern had won only one state. So it was an overwhelming uh, support for President Nixon. And they said the Democrats are allowed just to overturn that. And I said, well, why don't we listen to the facts and then decide whether or not uh, uh, President Nixon engaged in conduct that we would find offensive to the Constitution would amount to uh, a, a, mis a high crime or misdemeanor. So first we had to define what that meant and then apply the facts as they unfolded to the definition of what a high crime or misdemeanor was. So listening to that, to have a president um, engage in suborning perjury, uh, paying hush money, um, raising uh, funds uh, to keep those who are, who are going to jail to pay their lawyer fees, and et cetera. Um, that simply was conduct that is uh, unbecoming, was unbecoming of the president of the United States. But I have a very high standard for members of Congress, uh, to be sure, but the president of the United States is supposed to represent all of us. Aside from philosophical differences, he is the face of the country. And so I want the president of the United States to have a higher standard of conduct and not a lower one because he's president. And so I, I go back to my legal uh, studies and training and had a, a justice who said something that you are a fiduciary. If you're an elected official, appointed official, you are a, a trustee, a fiduciary. And a fiduciary has morals that are higher than that, that, that of the marketplace. We demand uh, the punctilio of an honor the most sensitive. So people should expect a higher level of conduct from those that they entrust, either their money or their lives and limbs uh, to protect. And so that was the standard that I wanted to adhere to. Uh, it wasn't shared by most of my colleagues at the time. And so there was a lot of hate mail that came in, uh, got death threats. Uh, and uh, I was prepared not to come back because the many of the Republican Party said, you're just loyal. We can't trust you. And we're going to vote uh, you out of office. And so I expected not to come back. And I was quite surprised that things turned around at the last moment when they found one of the missing tapes. And then um, Republicans went down to the president and said, no, we can't support you anymore. Uh, so it was a very tough time, but uh, um, it was one that I, I, I just felt there was, you have to insist upon compliance with the law. If you don't have the rule of law, then you have the rule of the jungle. And the rule of the jungle, simply uh, power goes uh, to uh, those who have the most either physical right. or um, uh, economic power. Uh, Bill, exactly. um, uh, you backed the right horse on that one, and we all knew it, especially us lawyers that felt the same way you did. Now, I'm going to cut right to the chase on this question. Um, with what's going on today, uh, I'm simply going to ask you if you agree with me that this upcoming election is without question the most interesting election in the United States that's going to be happening this presidential election. I just want to ask you to comment. You can say whatever you want to say about what's happening in this election when uh, one of the candidates has been indicted, uh, is being charged, is being in, in, in a court right now, in a federal court, about, uh, in, in a state court. I'm just gonna ask you to comment about your feelings as to what's gonna happen or what you think may happen in this election and how you feel about the candidates. Good, good question. Well, um, on the one hand, you say it's the most interesting election coming up. I think it's one of the most uh, existential elections coming up in terms of our yeah. democracy. Yeah. Uh, I would say we're on the doomsday clock as far as Armageddon uh, politically or from a democratic point of view, small d. Uh, we are 30 seconds away uh, from that clock hitting midnight. And I say that because I've never been in a situation or seen a situation where a candidate who I believe is as flawed, uh, unethical, uh, morally bankrupt, uh, and who engages in conduct that either he inspired or conspired um, with the uh, attempt to overthrow the election that can be indicted for so many crimes still has the support of millions, 70, 80 million American people. Yeah. Uh, that, to me, uh, poses a question to us. Are we really in favor uh, and support a democratic form of government, or are we slipping to what I would call either the edge of tyranny or anarchy? The anarchy would come first and then the tyranny. So we have to really go to this election with the understanding that 
if we have Mr. Trump uh, elected again, given his history, what he tried to do in the first term, if he is elected again, he will carry out a policy of vengeance and retribution, uh, charging all of his political uh, opponents with crimes uh, and uh, t- taking his vengeance out on those companies who did not support him and did not support him. And so you would see us slipping to a form of fascism, if I can put it that way, where the accumulation of power is based upon power and not upon principle and and upon the uh, threat of uh, uh, imprisonment uh, or worse. So I think that uh, we are very close to losing the very foundations of our country, believing that we're all subject to the rule of law, uh, that it applies equally to everybody. Uh, And it doesn't, just because you're president of the United States doesn't mean it doesn't apply to you. Mr. Trump thinks it doesn't apply to him. So I think it's, I think it's very dangerous where we are right now. I think it's very dangerous when my party uh, is uh, basically complicit uh, in uh, the liars club or establishing a liars club. Namely, you have to say that I don't believe that Joe Biden won this election. I think the election was stolen. If you don't say that, you're not welcome in the Republican Party anymore. And so to me, it's a very dangerous time because we need a strong Republican Party and we need one that's based upon the the tradition of law and order, strong uh, relations with other countries, strong defense, strong fiscal responsibility. Those principles really are the basis of our party. We're not talking about that now. All we're talking about is electing a man who wants to wreak vengeance upon those who have either criticized him, uh, impeached him, or tried to impeach him. Uh, I just think that if we do that, we know what he's done before. We know what he is promising to do in the future. And if that's the future, I think we're undone as a major player in this world because other countries are watching us. They're watching us and they're making a judgment. Is this a country we really want to follow? In terms of its leadership, yes, we've got a strong economy. Yes, it's free and open and capitalistic uh, in nature. But here's a a government, a government which is only subject to the whims of one individual, uh, which does not believe in the rule of law, uh, which will change policies overnight without hesitation, which undercuts respect for every institution in our country. You think about it. He has tried to undermine the integrity of the Justice Department, the FBI, the intelligence community, even uh, the military, heaping scorn upon individuals who've given their lives. He was in in the Arlington National Cemetery standing there with General uh, John Kelly, a four-star general who lost his son. And they were over the gravesite, and the president, then president, turned around and said, what's in it for all of them? They gave their lives. For what? And basically saying they're all suckers. John McCain, a loser. John McCain was my best friend. Uh, And I could go on about that. But that's what we're talking about the stake here. I want the president of the United States to look like and act like and revere that office and not turn it into some kind of a circus circus show. Amen to that. Uh, All I can say is I listened to George Mitchell answer a similar question. Uh, His thoughts and words, in my opinion, were gold. You just said it in so many words. I consider your impression also to be gold. Rob. With that said, uh, Bill, what impact uh, has social media had in creating this cult, uh, this mega cult that uh, is is, uh, laughing in the face of our democracy? I mean, if if, if you had Fox and Newsmax and all of these social media platforms back when you were serving on the Watergate committee, do you think that the, uh, the outcome might have been different? Uh, would, would Nixon have played that, that Fox, uh, Tucker Carlson uh, viewpoint that uh, has influenced so many, so many people in this country? What do you think, uh, Mr. Secretary? Uh, I think uh, he never would have been removed from office. I think um, social media, has given a platform to people who remain anonymous uh, to say anything that they want. Uh, It can be violent and is violent. It can be degrading. It can be threatening. Uh, It can uh, set in motion um, activities which undermine our uh, our society. Uh, 
So I don't think it had we had social media at that time. I don't think Nixon would have been threatened with impeachment or have agreed to step down. So I think social media has changed things much, much for the better in some aspects. But I guess what troubles me, there's no filter anymore. Uh, when Senator Mitchell and I were in office, we could say, well, we have three major networks. Uh, they, we've got uh, Uncle Walt, Walter Cronkite. Uh, you know, we've got three uh, major um, anchors in those three major networks. And we knew that the networks believed in trying to get the facts right and then get them out. Now we don't care about that. Social media doesn't care about facts at all. In fact, they want to have their own alternative facts, their own post-truth error, where you and I will not be able to distinguish what is true and what is false, what's real and what's memorix. And so they're, they're blending now and commingling truth and lies to the point where the people are not able to really distinguish uh, which, which, is, uh, which is the real thing, which is real truth. Uh, and which are lies masquerading as truth. Uh, Bill, um, I, I want to make some connections during this interview, um, and I'm going to lighten things up a little bit. I'm going to return uh, to a few years ago when you signed your latest novel, um, and um, I went there with Bob Corey, whose wife, Jan, works for you and does your institute, which I'm going to ask about. But I remember, Bill, what I enjoyed about that meeting that day is you had our picture taken, which, by the way, was in my introduction to the Dairy Run Show, a picture of you and me. But anyway, <laughs> you told me a story about Bowdoin beating the University of Maine in 1962 as I sat in the front row from Orono High School and watched you play that game. And I had forgotten a very important point about that game. Will you please tell that story about what happened to Bowdoin College and the University of Maine on the last game they ever played, 1962. <laughs> it probably was the most memorable game game of my life. Uh, there you go. Uh, it, you know, the University of Maine uh, had an undefeated record at that point. I think they went to the NIT uh, that year, but uh, um, they they were unblemished. They were a great uh, great basketball team. And Bowdoin, we came down. I think we had seven players, maybe eight. We didn't you said, even have. You said seven, seven. seven. That day. Yeah. And, and so we took the floor with seven people uh, warming up, and the crowd looked down and said, "My God, this is going to be a disaster." <laughs> uh, and I had um, an unusual night that night, and um, and scored quite a few points uh, beyond what I would normally do, I think. But we ended up defeating the University of Maine uh, with a basketball team. I must say, we. Uh, we were not high on the list of those that um, were seen as being uh, very accomplished. So it was a, a stunning moment. I think uh, we had uh, Wayne Champion uh, was yes. one of the guys at that time. We had the two brothers from uh, Old Town. Yes. Uh, and, you skipped, yeah, and, and you had Skip Chappelle. Skip Chappelle. And, uh, and Larry Shiner. And, uh, and the boys from Old Town, the Sturgeon boys. And you were out there shooting a, a two-handed set shot oh, from yeah. close to, uh, past the three-point line before they did the three-point line. And I watched you sink about, I don't know how many baskets, but you kept shooting that ball and it kept swishing in. And I turned to my friends and I, I had forgotten you won. And I said, I think Bowden's going to win. And you did. And that's when I decided to go to Bowden. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to tell you, my, you talked to my dad. My dad, um, I guess I got that two-handed shot from him because uh, I used to watch him play when... Uh, uh, when he was a young man uh, and and down at the YMCA and I would watch him shoot. So I guess I based it on that. But my father was a big influence on me in terms of basketball and, again, striving for excellence. One time in a church league game, uh, he was there watching me and I scored 43 points. Wow. And I walked over to the sideline and I uh, thought he was going to throw his arm around me and say, great game. And uh, as I went over and looked at him, he said, you know, if you hadn't missed those two foul shots, you would have had five. <laughs> that sounds like <laughs> <If> you, <hadn't, laughs> you could have done better. Go ahead, Rob. But, would, would... <laughs> but this is the, how he um, how he lived his life. He was never yeah. satisfied with the roles that he made. He always wanted to know, and we would drive down on a Jewish holiday. That's the only day he would take off drive to Boston to find out why their flour, their, their, the, the elements that they were making, go into the making of bread and the bulky, why were theirs better? 
And so he would then drive back or right to work because he was on 18 hours a day. Uh, and so he's always trying to improve his product and his service. And uh, and he has said, don't ever think that you've reached uh, your, your peak here. You can always do better. And just because you got 43, you could have had 45. And, and, and you've done that all your life, Bill. Yes, you, you, you weren't have. satisfied with Congress. You had to keep moving up. No. You would have been a great president. Go ahead. A uh, amen <laughs> to that, too. You know, your, your dad, obviously, was very proud of you. Uh, would Would he... Would you allow him to watch uh, you play basketball and uh, at the Y or some of the games that you played, Billy? Because I know uh, at one point you asked him not to come. Not well, to I, I did have to ask him not to come, not because of me, but because he would get up in the stands in the old Bangor Auditorium. I mean, the really old one that people yeah. don't remember down by the Paul Bunyan statue. It was just no. I do. I remember it. Go ahead. So he would get up in the stands and try to hang back, and he'd see me get out on the court, and he would yell out, go left, go right, shoot from here. And the players came to me and said, Bill, you got to talk to your father. Our fathers aren't down here. Because what he would do is he would drop off his rolls and bread at Miller's Restaurant, which was right. great. And then he would swing by the auditorium to watch me play. So they said, our dad's out there. you got to ask him to stop. So I went to him. I said, Dad, I'm getting a lot of heat for this, so just don't come to the practices. And one time, uh, he said, okay, I won't. One time, um, it's in the middle of winter, and I'm dribbling down the court, and I'm looking out, and I see a figure in the window. And my father was standing on a railing peering through the glass, and it was snowing, and he had, uh, he had about – four or five inches of snow on top of his hat. <laughs> he was up standing watching. And I never forgot that. Yeah. Uh, how much he wanted me uh, to succeed and, and took such pride in what I was doing. So it was a moment that I've never forgotten. And I mean, I, I, I didn't acknowledge that I saw him, but my heart was kind of jumping at that time. I bet. Uh, Bill, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to a heavy question now. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you're very concerned as former Secretary of Defense about Putin, about Kim uh, Jong, about these dictators. Uh, how do you feel about both of those people? And and if you can, some comments about Ukraine. Yeah, good. What do you feel about those particular individuals? Well, Kim Jong-un, uh, he uh, has a romance with the former president. Uh, President Putin was invited to participate in our elections back in 2016. I mean, if any other <clears throat> excuse me, president were to invite uh, Vladimir Putin to participate in our election system, they'd be voted out of office. <clears throat> excuse me. So he's got <clears throat> a friend in Putin. He's got a friend and a romance going with Kim Jong Un, or did. Uh, these are the two most brutal dictators on the world scene at this moment. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to take a quick. Yes. So <clears throat> they both now, well, of course, Russia is armed with nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea is also armed with nuclear weapons. And so they they present um, a, a threat to the to the world uh, in terms of ever using uh, nuclear weapons and can set off a chain reaction in that fashion. Um, I don't know that we can do much about it other than continuing to have a very strong deterrent. And that means keeping up with our capability to inflict uh, a similar type of uh, pain and suffering upon either Russia, North Korea, or any other country that would pose a threat to us. So we're we're on this uh, balance of power, balance of terror. I mean, we live, if you think about it, we live on the on the edge of a hair trigger of um, existential, I say, um, yeah, an existential threat to global stability, security, and existence. And so it'd be called an extinction level event should they start using nuclear weapons. So what we have to do is be able to deter that. You deter it by having a capability to say, don't do this because it's coming back at you. You have to try to defend against it. Very hard to defend because the weapon systems are getting faster, the missiles are getting faster, hypersonic missiles, et cetera. So it gets tougher to defend against that, but we still have to try. And then you have to have the capability of responding. And so it's uh, it's um, deter, defend, defend, and then defeat. Those are the three kind of um, 
of uh, words that we uh, we were using at the uh, Pentagon. Uh, it's more difficult now. You have obviously China. China is a nuclear power as well as a uh, global economic power. I would put them at the level of being a peer competitor of the United States. Others put them behind us. But when I look at what they've been able to do, uh, I would put them as a peer competitor. And we have to be very careful uh, that we, they and we don't engage in any kind of a nuclear exchange. So uh, I, I would say we're living in a dangerous time. And the best thing we can do is make sure that we are strong. That means we have to be economically strong to afford to be able to match or exceed their capabilities. We have to be diplomatically engaged. And we have to uh, be able to rally our allies. And this is where I really uh, am upset with uh, our Republican, my Republican friends, if there are any left uh, in the uh, in the Congress. And that is that um, we are now trying to pull aid away from Ukraine. Now, the Republican Party, we like to think that, uh, you know, you raise that flag, it means freedom means our freedom, but our freedom depends upon the freedom of other countries who work with us, our allies. And here you have Ukraine that is fighting for their lives, suffering massive casualties, horrific casualties. And you have members of Congress saying, no, we don't think we want to help them anymore. And that means Putin will just roll over them. Putin then changes the geography uh, of Europe and places all of our European allies in jeopardy, greater jeopardy. And then that sends a signal over to the Chinese who are now looking at Taiwan. And they say, well, you know, you really can't count on the United States. Putin made a calculation from the very beginning that the United States would fold over time, that we in a democratic society would not stand behind and support Ukrainians for the long term. So here we are, and it looks like they, that he was right, that you now have uh, elements of the Republican Party, not the major uh, part of it, but elements in the, uh, the House especially, of saying, pull, pull the funding out. I think it's, a, it's shameful. Uh, I think it will um, destroy our reputation uh, for, in much of the world, saying all you have to do is wait out the United States because they, don't, they can't hang in there as a democratic society. Bill, do you, what, do, what do you feel is the greatest threat facing our country today? Is, is it threats from within or the threats that you just talked about? Good the, question. The greatest threat that we face today. I think it's us. I think it's us. I agree. Uh, I, I think, you know, democracies historically don't live long lives. They live short, happy lives. And then because you have a democratic form of freedom of action, of thought and speech, in which people can uh, uh, argue, and that argument uh, then leads to lack of action, dysfunctionality. Uh, and so uh, the history of democracies is not a, you know, one of string of victories. So we have this noble experiment. It's been amazing to see what, how we started, how far we've come, the potential we have, but we can only do it if we're united on the big issues. We obviously are going to differ on democratic philosophy, Republican philosophy. That's 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 part of who we are. But now it's gotten to the point where bipartisanship is seen as dancing with the devil. We're dining with the devil. Uh, and uh, people who are seen as crossing over and trying to reach out and bring a consensus together. Uh, we're talking about Senator Mitchell before. Senator Mitchell and Senator Bob Dole couldn't be more opposite in terms of philosophy, in terms of governing, governance issues. And yet they trusted each other. They worked together. They respected each other. And they made the system work. Right now, it's uh, it's a form of warfare, which is now getting so negative, so degrading, uh, so almost pornographic in terms of the language that's used uh, about our political opponents uh, that, you know, it, it throws into a, a real question here, whether we are so committed to our declared virtues and values, or are we just whispering them and we really want power at any cost? And so it's a big issue coming up. And so I would say the biggest threat to us is, is, is Pogo. It's us. Because if we're united, there is no other country in the world that has the capabilities that we do, the natural resources, the ability to innovate, create, uh, and execute uh, these programs. So we have the, the great uh, potential, the ability 
and we are watching it simply grind to a halt as if uh, we're pouring cement into the gears of the government and to see if we can stop it, shut the government down. Think about that. Uh, it has it's now being talked about shutting the government down as a normal thing. This is not normal behavior. Governments are not supposed to shut down. Governments are there to serve the people. And if you shut it down, you're going to inflict hardship on millions of people, including our military, including our veterans, uh, including our civil servants, including Social Security recipients, Medicare, etc. And they say, well, we'll work it out. A little pain won't uh, be too bad. Uh, I think it's thank uh, you, Bill. Bill. Number one, uh, George Mitchell also talked about his friendship with Bob Dole. Number two, just this afternoon before I came here, I was talking to my niece about this government shutdown stuff, and I said, this panic, this fear that they put uh, on the Today Show, oh my God, we're gonna shut the government down, and I'm, it, it's just not right, but I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here. Um, this book that you wrote with your wife, one of the best books that could be written yeah, about excellent book. this race relations, and your poetry's in here, uh, I just love every part of it. and. Uh, Liz Armstrong and Francie Tolan from Bowdoin College gave me this book after I interviewed, we interviewed George Mitchell without knowing that you were our next interview. I couldn't believe that they did that by coincidence. What I want to ask you is this. Th this book that you wrote, Love in Black and White, can we agree that, s that uh, certain politicians running for the presidency of the United States have taken race relations and set them back about 100 years, this whole thing about changing the, the, the topics in school is about slavery being not so bad or whatever. Please comment on your feelings about the, the, the hot, heartwarming aspect of this book and what's happening in the country today with race relations. Good. Well, you know, race or racism has been central to our existence from the very beginning. Yeah. Slavery uh, really was uh, an institution uh, that uh, helped drive the economy. The uh, submission of human beings to uh, enslavement um, was a horrible um, existence or uh, certainly experience for us. And it took years in order to abolish it. But then you had sort of a an illegitimate son called Jim Crow. And then after Jim Crow, you had segregation, and then you had to have marches on Washington to say, we are human beings. We deserve what the, the, the statement over the Supreme Court, equal justice under law. And of course, not, go ahead. Never been granted. And so the race issue has always been drawn out during presidential elections. You cannot go back to an election in which race, blaming other people, especially those of color, now, my wife had an extraordinary relationship uh, experience. She was a daughter of a single parent mother. She grew up in uh, basically a, a, a ghetto. At one point in her life, uh, um, she and her mother had to live with 26 other people who are all relatives. Uh, and she went on to become uh, you know, a model of TV personality. personality. She was the um, Dr. King was her mentor. And she traveled with Dr. King for two years, the last two years of his life. Uh, dating Muhammad Ali, uh, who was a friend, uh, and so she was tied to the whole civil rights uh, movement. She was living with Mahalia Jackson uh, until she found her own place. So she was part of that group that said, hey, we are we've always been able uh, to uh, to do these things. It's always said that black people have come a long way. No, it's, she would point out it's the white people who come a long way, because you may remember um Black people as athletes were said, well, they're probably strong and they're fast, but they're not very smart. Um, and they said they could never be a pitcher. Well, guess what? They hit pitchers. They could never be quarterbacks. Well, guess what? Who are the quarterbacks today? Every time they've had an opportunity to compete at the same level and given the same uh, uh, education, they, uh, they compete well. But so race has always been with us and it's with us now. Uh, Trump is exploiting this. He does every time. Uh, and we have to uh, uh, we we have to try to be better, to be better uh, and to do better. But I, I think um, race has always been with us. It's getting better. Janet was given a uh, honorary doctorate at Bowdoin College uh, based upon her play, Anna Nemet, which is an imaginary conversation between uh, two of our uh, historic uh, martyrs as such, uh, Anne Frank and Emma Till. 
Uh, and so she was pointing out, yeah, you have anti-Semitism and racism. They have still been, they're still with us. And so what we have to do is try to not ban books, uh, not ban the history. I mean, if you if you if you eliminate history, if you twist history, if you tell a different history, then our students will never know what the facts are, so that we can build upon the facts of the past and make us better in the future. So, people who want to shape the future are trying to eliminate the past, so that those young people coming up won't know the history of slavery, why we had it, uh, why uh, did we have it, why did we have Jim Crow, why did we have segregation? I'll give you one other example. Think about this. Until a year or so ago, I guess about a year and a half, the National Football League had a standard for black athletes that didn't apply to white athletes. In other words, if the black athlete uh, suffered concussions or any kind of mental impairment, they had a higher proof, burden of proof uh, to show that uh, their, their injuries were inflicted by football than the white athletes did because they said black athletes were at a lower cognitive level. That is a rule that lasted for 100 years in the NFL that everybody's watching these days. So we think about that for 100 years. The officials at NFL said, well, they're not as smart as white people. So therefore, they have a higher burden of proof to show they have been impaired. Uh, anyway, uh, you ask about race. Race is part of our existence. But the point is, as Janet said of Bowdoin, it's getting better. It's getting better because more people are getting more opportunity. And they're seeing that if you treat people equally, we can make the pie bigger. We can benefit from experience of the Latin people, the Asian people, the black people, the African people. Uh, we can all get better as a result of it, build a better culture, build a better country. Bill, I'm going to look at the camera and thank you for such an encouraging comment and answer that question. Thank you so much. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you, you've worked and you've known so many people uh, through the course of your career. Uh, and I'd like to just throw out a couple of names and just if you could just kind of give me uh, just a, a sentence or two of what your, your thoughts. Bill Clinton. <laughs> One of the smartest people I've ever uh, met. He has an incredible mind. Uh, he has a great heart. Uh, and uh, I am so grateful that he gave me an opportunity to do something that's never been done before. And so I'll always be grateful to him for putting trust uh, in me and putting me in that position because there are many Democrats who were upset with him saying he didn't vote for you, he didn't contribute to you, he usually doesn't support any of your program, you, you're putting him in that position. So he had uh, a lot of flack that he had to take. Uh, I had very little. I had some on the Republican side that said, you're a traitor to uh, serve a Democratic president. Beyond that, it was the greatest experience of my life. President Biden. Uh, Joe is still Joe, although I can't call him that anymore. But he's a good Joe. Yeah, he, uh, he, and I, he and I went to Congress the same year. Uh, I went to the House in 72. He went to the Senate. Uh, over the years, we became uh, friendly. Um, his son, Bo, uh, interned one summer for me in my office, and my son, Kevin, interned in his office. Um, and so I got to see uh, uh, Bo Biden. I can understand why. Uh, our president, uh, Joe, he chokes up whenever he mentions son. He's just a great kid and had a tremendous future ahead of him. So uh, Joe Biden has a great heart. Uh, he uh, is somebody who traveled with me one time. I won't take the time to tell you. We went to Russia together to try and make a presentation on arms control. I had asked uh, President Reagan if I could bring one Democrat. And he said, absolutely. I picked Joe Biden to go with me. That's cool. Uh, Bill, uh, we're almost running out of time, but I want to mention one name to you uh, who was in your class, who after he heard I was going to interview you with Rob, uh, took me to lunch. Uh, his name is Peter Webster, and I know you know Peter Webster very well. He insisted on meeting with me before, and uh, he's done some projects with you. And the one thing uh, that he told me was that you folks went to Fort Lauderdale uh, on spring break, which I also did my junior year, uh, Bill. But because we're running out of time, I cannot Jesus. ask you what happened there, because what's happened in Lauderdale stays in Lauderdale. I can't thank I'm you gonna, enough for this I'm, wonderful I'm interview. Pleading, huh? I'm pleading the Fifth Amendment. I'm sorry. Whatever Peter told you, I'm going to just I, plead the Fifth. 
Do we have time to ask Bill one more question? Yes, but I'd, I'd I like did to, want to mention Peter Webster. He says to say hi. <laughs> but I, I, I wanted to give uh, Bill an opportunity to talk about any new initiatives, any new books, any, anything that you're working on that we, we should know about. A book of poetry. The greatest <laughs> poet at Bowdoin College was Wadsworth Longfellow. Oh. And number two was Bill Cohen. William Sebastian <laughs> Cohen. Yes. Well, I've been doing a lot of reading rather than writing, but I, for the past 10 years or so, I've been the producer of uh, Janet's play. And that play has now uh, been performed in about uh, 35, 40 cities. It also was performed in the United States Supreme Court and also uh, in uh, in Amsterdam. So I've been producing that, which is like owning a stable of racehorses in terms of the expense of it and uh, all the details that go into it. But uh, lately, I've just been reading. I've been reading a lot. I have a copy of um, Pat Moynihan's uh, papers that came out, uh, and it's um, brilliant. His papers he gave to the Library of Congress. It said the total, uh, the total of the papers would be three times the height of the Washington Monument. So I'm, I'm working my way through that. I'm reading uh, the book I told you, The Coming Wave. I've been reading um, uh, a, a, a couple of books written by James Love Luck. He uh, was a British inventor, physicist, uh, humanitarian. Uh, he lived to be 103. And I saw interviews with him when he was 102. And I said, I've got to read this man. So I've been reading his book, uh, A Rough Road to the Future, and another one called uh, Novacine. Uh, and they're brilliant books about where we're going with uh, with technology. So I'm focusing on some of the history. I've been reading um, Chris Buckley, whom I think is one of the one of the best comedic satirists uh, in the business today. And once I started reading him, I started reading uh, his father's books and uh, and papers. Uh, so I've been doing just a lot of reading uh, to try to catch up on books that I have. I have about two to 3,000, uh, and I have another um, thousand on Kindle. So it's uh, I have my little uh, uh, Kindle that I go uh, at night till three in the morning uh, trying to read uh, the works of other people. So that's what I do in my spare time. Well, that's Bill, cool. um, uh, three comments. I've written a couple of books, a law book uh, on how to handle personal injury cases and a book about my daughter who is transgender. But I'm and also I trying to produce a musical about Bobby Rydell, who became a very dear friend of mine, and who was had big hits when you were at Bowdoin. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I want to tell you that we are about to interview, next our uh, next interview, a 101-year-old man from my neighborhood who is just like the guy you talked about, sharp as a tack, and uh, uh, you saying that you had a conversation with that man is inspirational. Uh, I just can't uh, tell you uh, how, how impressed I am with your career, and you have a 1,000 books to read and, and uh, uh, many years to read them. And Go ahead, Bob, we've got a few more minutes. Yeah. One more thing, Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell is one of the giants, uh, certainly in Maine history, and I would say our country. Uh, you cannot look at his career, what he is able to do with the Good Friday uh, Agreement, but to lead the Senate majority uh, in the way he did it with such intelligence and skill and humor. Uh, he's got a great set of uh, funny bones in him, and uh, and I can just tell you, it was a joy for me to represent the state of Maine with him. And even though you picked him as your number one and me number two, I have to point out that I was the senior senator and he was the junior senator. <laughs> I forgot he, that part. He really became majority leader, and he had used that as a club over me ever since, because I, as a senior senator, always got priority. And he said that's why he ran to be majority leader, so he would give speeches and then I would have to follow him. So, but I want to say, following uh, George Mitchell was one of the real honors of my life. He is one of the finest um, people that I know, and certainly one of the finest public servants. And you two people, he's in a pod, as far as I'm concerned. Well, ahead, and, and as <laughs> and as a Mainer, looking at uh, the Senate at that point in time, where you had uh, Senator Cohen and Senator Mitchell. As I said earlier, we, that was at the, the top of the scale. And we've had others, Olympia Snow, Susan Collins, and Margaret Chase Smith. Uh, we've been fortunate. Angus King, unbelievable. Uh, yeah, we've had a distinguished uh, 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 statesman in this thing. Yes, well, we still sure. have a couple more minutes. Margaret Chase Smith. Mar would you say, uh, Bill? Margaret Chase Smith. Margaret Chase Smith. Absolutely. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, is there anything, uh, I, first of all, with all the issues that we talked about today, are you planning to continue to speak out 
and get involved uh, in the upcoming campaign in any way? What are your plans? Because your voice, particularly as a Republican, and what the Republican Party really represents over the course of our history, needs to be heard. I mean, what are your plans going forward, uh, Bill? Well, I, I still plan to speak out. I am invited to uh, go on CNN uh, from time to time. Uh, yep. I also on MSNBC, um, uh, Bloomberg, BBC. So whenever I, I am called uh, upon to say something, I try and speak out. Uh, I am also joining uh, with an effort to discourage uh, the creation of, of a third party. Uh, I think the next election is so serious in terms of whether or not we're going to continue as a democratic uh, country, a democratic republic, um, that bringing in a third party, even though there are a lot of people who are unhappy with both choices for whether it's Trump uh, or uh, President Biden, uh, creating a third party will only result in the election of uh, Donald Trump. And I think that would be disastrous for our country. There are Republicans out there who are running, uh, any one of which we could look to and say, that's a better choice. But re-electing um, uh, or electing uh, Donald Trump, uh, I think, would pose a clear and present danger. We've seen what he has done. We saw him try to bribe and extort money from Ukraine. We saw what he did and encouraged people to storm the Capitol. We know what he wants to do in terms of military. Uh, uh, taking the military and politicizing it. Right. What other president in the history of this country has ever called for the execution of the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? Uh, that is something, it's such an anomaly. It is so outrageous that a, any individual, not to mention the commander in chief saying, I want to uh, uh, have the death penalty. I should have had the death penalty if this has been uh, tried in the past because he's a traitor. We owe uh, an allegiance to what the chairman did. He saved our country, our democratic form of government. And the notion that you would call for his death, assassination, encouraging others by implication to carry this out as one uh, of Congress that he should be hung. To me, we are, as I've said to others, we are taking Pat Moynihan's uh, words defining deviant behavior down. We are lowering the bar of acceptable behavior to say that you have a president who can engage in the kind of behavior he did, who can uh, say that John McCain's not a hero, uh, uh, all of the things mock uh, disability. Uh, I'm sorry that we cannot afford to have a third party. I, I might have been in past supportive of that to ought to break the logjam, but yeah. in this particular case, it's the most dangerous thing we can do. So I'm going to join uh, a bunch of uh, uh, Dick, Har Dick Gephardt and others and try to encourage uh, states to make sure they don't. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, thank you, Bill. We're out of town, Bill, but I just only have one request. I would love to have you back on either before or after the election. Thank you so much for this interview and your incredible wisdom uh, in discussing these issues. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, uh, Ms. Uh, Senator uh, Cohen, Bill Cohen, uh, to all of us in Maine. And thank, thank you, you Bill. So. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.